Okay, tell us about being a rabbi with, with instead of prayer, you said it's a basis of like the organizing principle of the group. Like, yeah. I don't know why you guys come together. Maybe you come together because you all love to daven shachri. Maybe you come together because you like a Shabbat dinner, because you have appreciation of the <laughs> ocean. I don't know. I don't know what it is, right? But well, for us, for us, we live on the coast side. Right. Right. So you love the ocean and you are looking for community. And maybe some of you actually do pray three times a day, but synagogues are <laughs> organized on that principle, right? Yeah, that's it's right. It's big room for people to come in and to open books and to stand there and to do this. And sometimes they know what they're doing and sometimes they don't. But what they're looking for is community and connection and content and to be moved to have their milestones marked and all of those things. All of the demographic studies of late have shown that Jews like to do stuff with other Jews, right? It's not necessarily that they're coming to pray together. You know, they, uh, this game. They, they, they are coming to be in community. And so I want to bring them together around cycling Maybe we're going to ride to Sacramento on Friday, have Shabbat dinner Friday night. Saturday, we'll ride home. We'll stop at the beach. We'll have a moment of gratitude, say the Shema, a few other things, and keep riding. Uh, maybe we'll study the, you know, Thursdays. People will meet me at a coffee house and we'll do the Torah portion. And then we'll all ride home and we'll talk about it. It doesn't have to be standing doing sit down stand up it's about connection and gratitude and awe and reverence um gosh darn that's fantastic and and how many people do you have doing that well i'm at the beginning i don't know if you've ever heard of cli which is the clerg in a clergy leadership incubator uh -huh. and um <clears throat> so I'm, I'm getting started uh we'll see you know uh, when i did the, the centuries and things like that i had 200 people 300 people sign up for them it's been a long time and part of me also the aging this aging thing in the last six months i've had two major injuries to my feet um and there's some days that i think i mean maybe it's it is a great idea and maybe i'm not the one to do it anymore but we're gonna see how it all gets started you know mm -hmm. so you know it's about for me for me, Jewish expression, this does not have to be, I don't feel bounded to me. It has to be this way, you know? So whether we could come together and have a spiritual moment about cooking and, and legacy and heritage and history and contentful that way too, you know? So. Wow, fantastic. Well, I, <clears throat> I'm really excited to hear how that works out. And it's just wonderful that you're, it seems like you're doing what you love. Yeah, I am doing what I love. And that's, um, that's a blessing. Not everybody I know has, it, it's, you know, gets to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, why it isn't, isn't ultimately one of our searches to be authentic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I hope my authenticity comes with my passion. Yeah, yeah, it certainly does. How has being a woman, has that been a factor for you at all or, or not really? You know, my, my uh, it has, but not, you know, not in a way that anybody who actually became a rabbi would, you know, my father, and my, my grandfather, when I told him I was 21, I wanted to be a rabbi, he called me a Jewish nun. My father said, what are you doing? You'll never have time for to have a husband and children. You know, um, they all discouraged me. And uh, I went off to Israel to find a more traditional life. And then HUC didn't feel right when I went. It was wrong. So I went off to find the truth. And that led me to Israel and away from the rabbinate for a while. Um, so I think I faced more discrimination in very particular powerful ways, like the formative ways. Nobody said, 
because I'm the age of all these people, right? I would be in those first classes. Um, nobody said you should go for it in my family, right? I didn't have a bat mitzvah. I did it myself when I was 22. Um, as much of a woman's liber as my mom is, she never was, they didn't come from a family where there was any content ju Judaically that mattered to her. So, so I was told not to do it very clearly. Um, and I don't know what it is either. Maybe this is your experience and you can ask Amy this, what does it mean to be a rabbi? You know, when you go, come out of HUC, you know, you're going to get a pulpit, you're going to bury people, marry people. What are you going to do with it? I'm not interested. I mean, I like to bury and marry and be there for moments of meaning for people, but I'm much more interested in taking those ideas and spreading them and seeing, and seeing how that they impact. Um, you know, so, and so being a rabbi doesn't actually, you're not a plumber. It's not so clear what you're going to do with that degree. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you, Jamie, for joining us and for sharing your story with us. And I think we'll continue our relationship and friendship and uh, you'll see us and some of our people. Great. Time. Great. Yeah. Great. Terrific. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for the thank opportunity. Yeah, great. Thanks, now I want to say pass, hi to pass the baton. <laughs> yes, pass the baton to Rabbi Amy Eilberg. I want to mention, I just have a couple things written here. Uh, rabbi Amy was the first woman ordained as a conservative rabbi. It was out in, by JTS in 1985. That's right. Long time ago. It's hard to believe. She serves as a spiritual director, peace and justice educator, and a teacher of Musar. I want to hear more about that. Uh, she currently chairs two anti-racism committees. Do you still do that? I do. One at Congregation Eitz Chaim in Palo Alto, a friend of uh, Sister Congregation, and also one for the conservative movement. She's authored the book, From Enemy to Friend, Jewish Wisdom and the Pursuit of Peace. You co-founded the Bay Area Healing Center, Jewish Healing Center, and also directed a program to help synagogues and Jewish organizations practice conflict resolution. You continue to write and teach on the mitzvah of pursuing peace and on the art of dialogue. So thank you for being with us. I want to say I'm, I'm embarrassed that we don't have more people. Uh, part of the problem is that the, um, the notice I sent out this morning had the wrong Zoom link. Oh. So I'm, I'm keeping an eye out to see if I see anyone else joining us uh, or trying to get into the other room. But I, I think we have probably lost a few along the way. Anyway, thanks for being with us. Uh, anything uh, you want to say before I start peppering you with questions? <laughs> no, pepper, pepper away. <laughs> okay. Where Where are you now? Are you You're in the East Bay somewhere, right? I'm in the South Bay, South mid, Bay. mid Peninsula, South Bay. I live in Los Altos. I see. Okay, and that's and so you're a member or active, you know, participant in some I'm, of Eight Stream. I'm active both at Eitz Chaim. I mean, my longtime shul is Kolomet, which is the conservative shul in Palo Alto, mm -hmm. um, which I've been very, which has been my shul home since 1990. And then for a number of reasons, um, it became a little less of a home for me. Um, so I now belong to both, both Kolomet, the conservative place, and Eitz Chaim, which is um, independent, independent shul. Mm, okay. And, and I, I gather that, like Jamie, you're doing what you love. I mean, you must feel really good about just the opportunities to to do mitzvahs like every day. I mean, you know, impossible to count at this point, I'm sure. I'm, um, I'm really blessed uh, that I have been able to create my own rabbinate. I mean, there was something unique about when I was ordained and mm -hmm. I was the first blah, blah, blah. Um, but then my um, my path unfolded in a way that was unusual. It's not unusual anymore because now many many rabbis are doing, um, you know, kind of doing their own their own creative fashioning of what a rabbinate can look like. Um, but I've I've done that for much of my career, um, with the exception I used to. I worked in as a hospital chaplain. I worked in hospitals. I worked at the Jewish Healing Center. Uh, but for the past 27 years, I've been a private practitioner, and um, and I love it. Mm. Um, yeah, so it was not the conventional congregational rabbi route that you took, but uh, 
involving chaplaincy and and conflict resolution and a lot of that. I, I think I saw that you worked with uh, Faith in Action Bay Area for a while. I did. Right? I did. I, I had a um, I had, had a job. I had a great passion, really a calling to work on issues of um, of of peace and reconciliation, uh, which began with a visit to a dialogue center in Israel, um, where I witnessed a, the beginning of a three-day dialogue program between uh, a group of 100 uh, 16-year-olds, half of them Israeli Jewish and half of them Israeli Arab. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt that uh, I just sort of lit me, lit me up and I felt that I'd been called to find some way to work on the cause of peace. So that, that took, took me through interfaith dialogue and a lot of intra-Jewish dialogue around, at the time, mostly around Israel. Um, I wrote my book about Judaism and, and conflict, peace building. Um, and then I had this wonderful job for Pardes in which I was teaching rabbis and congregations around the country and the U.S. Um, best practices in dialogue facilitation and Jewish text on peace and conflict um, until, and just to say this, this what I'm about to say will have a political um, overtone. I'm just going to speak honestly for myself and not assume, hope that I don't offend anyone, but not assume that everyone is of the same point of view, but just to tell my own story, which was... Um, when Donald Trump was elected in 2016, I felt that uh, I could, I didn't, I no longer wanted to spend uh, so much energy teaching Jews about conflict resolution. I needed to work in justice and justice making. So mm -hmm. it was at that point that I got this amazing job at Faith in Action, which is a multi faith, multi racial, multi everything, um, faith based organizing network. Yeah, we it we shows, have a connection. Our side as well. Yeah, yeah. We, have, we our community is very involved with Faith in Action Bay Area. Great, fantastic. Yeah. Um, I did a training for working for them. I did a training on justice work to rabbis um, throughout the throughout the West Bay. Um, mm -hmm. um, and then the job ended, and then COVID came, and then I was you know back back solo again. Hmm. But I'm glad. I'm glad you work with Faith in Action. Hmm. It's a wonderful organization. Yeah. I want to open it up to anyone if you've got any questions. I mean, I could keep going, but I'd love to hear from some of our other participants here. Anything? Um, how would you say, how has being a woman impacted your experience in Judaism throughout your life? That's a big question. I've lived a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that I, I'll talk about my my adult life and my my rabbinate in particular. Um, the kind of rabbinate that I chose, well, partly because I wasn't allowed into rabbinical school when I first received the call to to the rabbinate, so. Um, I had to struggle to figure out what to do instead and what to do with myself and whether to wait or whether whether to give up. Um, so during that time, before the seminary, the Jewish Theological Seminary, the seminary of the conservative movement where I was ordained, before um, JTS opened its doors to um, women rabbinical students, I went to social work school because at some point I said to myself, you know, it may not happen in my lifetime. I may not get to be called rabbi with a capital R, um, but I'm going to make myself into a rabbi with a small R because I'd spent a lot of years studying Talmud. I'd been in the graduate program at JTS in Talmud. Um, so then I decided to go to social work school to put together my text learning with people learning. Um, and as I'd been, been at JTS, which was a very, very male dominated uh, flavored place to Smith School for Social Work, which was as female and feminine and and um, what that comes up is stri powerfully 
feminine and feminist as the as the seminary was uh, was patriarchal. Um, so by the but, and then after that, I got my MSW and and then the seminary let me in. Um, so by the time I entered rabbinical school officially, I was already a social worker, a clinical social worker. So um, the kind of rabbi that I became, partly because they didn't let me into rabbinical school when I when I wanted, so I had these other experiences <laughs> along the way, um, has been feminine in a in in the stereotypical way. That is to say, to the extent that society trains women to be more relationally oriented, less oriented toward power and authority and achievement, and more oriented toward um, relationship and the well-being of people. Parenthetically, that doesn't mean that there aren't men who are relational and there aren't women who are strong, right? But that's a matter of the, the socialization that, that we all receive. Given that sociological frame, um, my rabbinate was all relational. I had my MSW, went back to the seminary, got ordained, became a hospital chaplain. Um, and then I became a spiritual director, which is all about, my, most of my career has been about listening. Um, as a hospital chaplain, as a hospice chaplain, as a spiritual director, that's something we didn't, um, uh, we didn't mention uh, for 20 some years. I've practiced a form of spiritual counseling called spiritual direction, which is borrowed from the Catholic community. It's an ancient Roman Catholic uh, practice, which in the 60s and 70s made its way into American Protestantism. And then in the 90s and aughts uh, found its way into, into Judaism as well. It's a, it's a way I sit with people and create a space that helps them to attend to what's unfolding for them spiritually in their in their lives. So it's also a listening practice. And when I was called into peace and conflict work, I thought, wow, this is like it's like a new, you know, whole whole new territory. And I had to read a million books and do a whole lot of trainings or whatever. Then at some point I realized it's a listening practice. Uh, conflict facilitation is also a listening practice. Um, it's a little challenging for me to see how my justice work, and I do a lot of anti-racism work, and I and I use my listening for sure. Um, but my my justice work also is is a is an is an assertive practice um, of really encouraging people, um, challenging people. Um, to interrogate their own beliefs. So I don't know, that was sort of a long rambling answer to, uh, to your question. Well, I hope that you, made some sense. Can you give us an example in your justice work? I mean, how you might have had to challenge someone. Um, I'm putting you on the spot here. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you a story that I heard today. It wasn't me, but um, I had my meeting today of the... Um, the, the conservative movement in, in the US and around the around the world um, has something called the Social Justice Commission. And with, within the Social Justice Commission, there's subcommittees that um, work on various issues. There's one on democracy and there's one on reproductive rights and there's one on LGBTQ and there's one, did I say environment? What, you get the idea. And one on um, racial justice. So that's the one that I chair. So we had that, we had one of those meetings today and um, someone, a rabbi on the committee who works in a congregation said at one point, and the, the Social Justice Commission has been doing a lot of work on uh, LGBTQ issues. It recently released a movement-wide pride guide for the first time ever for the conservative movement. Um, so someone in his congregation said to this conservative rabbi, but I mean, capital C conservative, he's not he's progressive said you know i don't know what it is these days every time i turn on the tv um i see gay and lesbian couples like that's all i see is like gay and lesbian couples it's like it's uncomfortable and the rabbi told us i don't know what the tone was because i wasn't there but the rabbi told us that he turned to his congregant and said 
can you imagine what it's been like for gay and lesbian people who've been watching TV all these many, many years and never seen couples that looked like them and the people they loved? Now, depending on what the tone was, I just said it in a kind of kindly tone. That could be said in a more confrontive tone, but that's... Um, that's a way I try to say it kindly, but it's it's a way of saying um, there are things you're not looking at. There are things that you need to interrogate. The things that, because of where you come from and the bias that we all the the bias that we've all been raised with, because we live in a society that is so racially charged that it's just in the air. Um, mm. um, that creates a kind of blindness. In especially in us white people, um, and I think it's our obligation to um, to look at that and to recognize the ways in which we're privileged, and to recognize recognize ways in which um, our comfort in American society has been built on the discomfort of people and co people of color. So and how's that? You see, I could say it in a I say it in a kindly way, but those are challenging things to say. I think. Yeah. 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 Tell us about uh, Musar um, and your practice and how that's manifesting. Yeah. So um, you know, I sort of knew about, vaguely knew about Musar, but it was taken seriously um, during my rabbinical training. Um, but I really started encountering it in a serious way when uh, I ran a spiritual Jewish spiritual direction program that was doing spiritual development with teaching spiritual development to people who were training to become Jews who were training to become spiritual directors. And one of the systems that we used, one of the Jewish systems of spiritual development that we taught related to Musar. And I really loved it. Um, just loved it. Came to know Alan Marinus, you know, I assume mm -hmm. sure. some of you know his work. He's a brilliant thinker and, teacher and incredible writer um, um but then when it's sort of in the next iteration I, I i've i've had a sort of serially monogamous um you know uh, career a rabbinate as some of you may realize congregational rabbis are generalists they do a little bit of everything. They preach, they teach, they do pastoral care, they do funerals, they do weddings, they do you know a whole range of things. And some people love that. I've been sort of a specialist in one area and then in another area and then another area. So you know, over a lifetime, I've done done all a lot of those things. Um, when I was really very very actively exploring and practicing and teaching and writing about uh, peace and conflict. Um, especially when I was writing my book, um, I, re I realized that the midot, the qualities of soul that are the center of Musar practice, are exactly the same qualities of soul that are required for being a helpful presence in the context of conflict. Now, I, that's not to say that the rabbis who created the Musar system were, they didn't create it as a conflict conflict management system. But when I thought about my own practice in conflict facilitation, what really, you know, I'd studied all kinds of facilitation models and um, uh, systems of thought and theory of conflict and conflict analysis and all of that. What really made a difference what really made the difference between my being a helpful presence in, in the midst of conflict and not being a helpful presence was the state of my midot, the extent to which I could embody humility, patience, courage, respect, kavod, and I can, um, knowing how to be still and quiet sometimes so the whole list the last chapter of my book is lists i think 10 10 of the me don't that i think of as qualities for um for conflict resolution by which i mean not just for mediators but for mm -hmm. all of us who find ourselves in conflict situations at the dinner table or you know 
in Shoal, wherever, wherever it may be. So that's when I really became very, very deeply engaged uh, in Musar. And since then, I've uh, written and I've taught with the Musar uh, Institute and taught taught Musar to a lot of lot of Jews. And it's uh, I've seen a lot of people who've considered it transformative in mm. their lives. Well, I think we would testify to that. We we've had a, quite a done quite a bit of it in our community. Uh, a few of the member uh, people who are uh, on this call right now are very active with the Musar Chevruta group. Wonderful, uh, one or another. So uh, yeah, I'm. I feel affirmed that you also found the value in it as we have. I'd, I'd it, like to make a comment to Rabbi Amy, if I may. Please. Um, I just want to say that because there's a great deal of political conflict and racial conflict in my family, I love the idea of bringing the soul qualities to the table when in an everyday discussion. So thank you for that. You're very welcome. I think that's what makes the difference. When we grant ourselves in kavod, respect, and humility, Anava, knowing that as passionately committed as I am to my point of view, I, I actually don't know everything much as I'd like to. And and curiosity, um, compassion, kindness, you know, all, all of those things. That's what that's what makes all the difference. Grounded in that place, uh, conversations just don't spiral out into in those awful ways that um, that unfortunately we've all seen and read about in the news every day. Mm -hmm. Can, can I add one one final thing? Just sort of yeah. tying this all together. Right. It's um, it's finding whatever that that kernel of resonance and meaning is in whatever the actions are, whether it's musar and bringing it to the to the dining room table, or um, you know, every morning right now, many of us get up and we blow our our shofar for Elul. <laughs> and and I have a I have a, ki a son who's sort of stuck in in the moment. And I've been trying to like motivate him to do some other things. Anyway, I said to him, you know, and I'm always, he's not, I said to him, honey, get out of bed every morning. We'll blow the shofar together. And I thought he was going to say like, yeah, right, mom. He said, yeah. And every day so far this week, he has gotten up and he lives in Boise, Idaho. And I live here and we meet on Zoom and we blow and we blow the shofar. And every day it's like I think it's actually giving him a sense of accomplishment. Like he got himself out of bed at a certain time. And you know, he's gonna he know and I framed it as this is the way to make the next year better, you know, making steps. And so I, I guess I'm bringing it up because it's somewhere between a humanist application, a, a psychological approach to change, deep religiosity, you know, all, all of it, you know, uh, all of it together. So whether you're doing Musar or you're doing social work or you're doing davening all the, you know what, it, it's all, it's, it, it seems like it's, it's all, uh, It's all that we it's all that we can do to bring meaning into the moment. So anyway. Amen to that. We we do we say <laughs> amen like that. Hey, uh thank you very much, Rabbi Amy. What's that? Tell me about your amen. Oh, it's American this? Sign Language to say Amen. With this? like this? With yeah. This well, you have your palm and your you scoop with your left hand and end like that. We, oh, we, I would be scooped with my right. Oh, well, it could be oh, either. No. Actually, I'm not sure. We should look that up. But that's, that's the way they say I mean, We've nice. been doing it on Zoom for, for years Oh, I, I like that. Yeah. Oh, I really like that. You scoop with your right hand. Oh, scoop, scoop with the right with hand? Right okay. Hand. Right. I really like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, embody. Hey, embody uh, thank you so much for your time. It, very generous. And I'll be My in pleasure. touch. Um, I think there right. are some things Wonderful. we want to follow up on with the both of you. Uh, Rabbi Jamie, would you be so kind as to, to blow the shofar? That would be a good note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm practicing. I'm not so good at this one. It's a hard shofar to blow. <laughs> Ah! <laughs>
Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So uh, wishing you all uh, a good uh, able and that the Yamim Noraim are good and full fulfilling for all of you. And um, Thanks, God willing to be together again one day. Amen. Nice, nice to be together. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.